Philippians chapter 1, going to talk this morning about this is my prayer. Philippians 1, going to start reading in verse 9. Uh, while you find your way there, we do have a water baptism next Sunday afternoon. Um, if you have not been baptized in water since you've become a believer in Jesus, I'm not going to tell you to pray about it because we don't have to pray about doing things Jesus commanded us to do. We just have to do it. Uh, you know, water baptism, believer's baptism, is a step of obedience. And when we follow Jesus in that step of obedience, it releases his blessing. Maybe you were baptized as a baby. I was baptized as a baby. And that's meaningful to the extent that it was an expression of faith on the part of your parents. But uh, it's not the same as believer's baptism that Jesus uh, commanded and the early church practiced. And so next Sunday afternoon, we have a baptism. We'd love for you to be part of it. There's a sign-up sheet out on the Welcome Center. Next Sunday morning, we'll have a, a baptism class during the service uh, to explain uh, what water baptism is, believer's baptism, why we do it. And then we'll be baptizing next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock in Austin. Don't forget Wednesday evening with our friend Pastor Judy Shaw. Uh, it's, it's, it's <laughs> All right, <laughs> give it up for Pastor Judy Shaw. Uh, it's easy to forget because, because uh, Tuesday is the 4th. It's easy to forget that we're here Wednesday evening at 7. We have a special program for the kids downstairs. If you have never heard Pastor Judy Shaw, she is a powerful, anointed woman of God. She has a, a very strong prophetic anointing, and uh, it's going to be a great night. It's going to be, we're having a Greenwich Outpouring reunion during the month of July on Wednesday evenings, so we hope you'll come be with us. Look with me, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Let's talk about this is my prayer. Philippians chapter, nine, uh, Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is a, a, a tightly packed little prayer of Paul, and we're going to unpack it together with God's help. Let's pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us. Father, I pray that we would encounter you this morning through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen. When you pray, what do you pray about? What are the contents of your prayers? Whom do you pray for? What do you ask God to do? What is the cry of your heart to God? What is the substance of your prayer life? Recently, a group of 1,100 Americans was surveyed about prayer. You might be surprised to hear that almost half 48% said that they pray every day. I was actually really encouraged by that number. 84% said that they had prayed in the last week. Probably doesn't surprise you that women said they were twice as likely as men to pray. Amen. Guys, they're probably praying because of us. <laughs> but what do Americans pray about? This top 10 list was compiled by Max Lucado. You might know his name. Yeah. This is counting down from least prayed for to most prayed for. What do Americans pray about? Number 10, least prayed for, was government leaders. Mm. Only 5% said they pray for them. Clearly, more prayer is needed <laughs> urgently. <laughs> Maybe this July 4th, we should set aside a little time to give thanks to God for America and to pray for our country and to pray for our leaders. Listen, God, you know, if God can change the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, he can change the heart of anybody, amen? So we need to pray. It turns out that some people pray vindictive prayers. Number nine on the list was prayers for someone's relationship to fail, presumably because of jealousy or out of spite. And number eight was prayers for someone to get fired. Well, for something bad to happen to someone. 
Apparently, we need to go back and look at the words of Jesus a little bit more closely. Beloved, those are not the kind of prayers that please the heart of God. But all is not lost. Number seven on the list was praying for someone's enemies positively. Praying for their forgiveness. Praying for their change of heart. 20% said that they pray for the salvation of people who have no faith or who belong to some other faith other than Christianity. Number five was prayer for victims of tragedies or natural disasters. Number four was prayers for my own sins, that God would forgive me, that God would give me grace to change. Number three was prayers for good things to happen to me. So just to be clear, more Americans are praying for blessings than praying for God to forgive their sins or asking for strength to change. I found that interesting. And here were some of the blessings that people said they prayed for. Half said that they pray behind the wheel for a good parking spot. <laughs> All right, how many people, shame the, shame the devil, tell the truth, how many people have ever prayed for a good parking spot? If you've ever been to Whole Foods in Greenwich, you've, you've prayed that prayer. <laughs> they also said they didn't pray for a speeding ticket. Prayed that they wouldn't get a speeding ticket. I may or may not have prayed that prayer a couple of times. 25% said they prayed for their sports team to win. 20% said they prayed to win the lottery. You know, so they could help us finish phase two. <laughs> Number two on the list was prayers about my own problems, my own difficulties for God's help. 72% said they pray for that. I was pleasantly surprised to read the number one thing that Americans said they pray about. Number one on the list was prayers for family members or friends. Prayers for their healing, for God's help in their problems, for their success, for their well-being. 84% said that they pray for family and friends. But still, if you know the Bible at all, there are some glaring omissions from this top 10 list. It, it doesn't really reflect the prayer priorities of either Jesus or Paul. When we pray, what should we pray for? You know, one way that we can grow in our prayer life is to study the prayers of the Bible. In Philippians 1, we have a unique opportunity to study one of Paul's prayers. In verse 4 of Philippians 1, Paul says, I am always praying for you. But then in verses 9 and 11, Paul tells us exactly what he prays. Paul gives us a, a wonderful glimpse into the contents of his own prayer life. And it's a little bit loftier than praying for a good parking spot. Looking at Paul's prayer, I find four petitions that I want to share with you quickly this morning. Four petitions. This is my prayer. Four petitions from Paul. First, my prayer is for love's increase. My prayer is for love's increase. Now we have to step back for just a moment and we have to remember Paul's circumstances when he prayed this prayer for his friends, the Philippians. At this point, Paul had been a prisoner of Rome for over three years. After writing his masterpiece letter to the Romans, Paul set sail from Greece for Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, he was arrested during a riot in the temple. The, the Romans actually arrested him to save his life. But then he was unjustly held in prison for two years by crooked governor Felix, who was hoping to get a bribe out of Paul. To save his life, Paul finally appealed to Caesar in Rome. He spent almost a full year on a prison transport ship. He barely survived a shipwreck during a ferocious hurricane at sea. Luke tells us that when Paul finally did reach Rome, he was permitted to remain under house arrest at his own expense, but he was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When the Philippians heard about Paul's situation, they dispatched Epaphroditus to go and serve Paul any way they could, and they sent a love offering. When Paul received that outpouring of love from his friends, he called Timothy to his side, and he began to dictate what is the most personal of all of his letters. You know, if you were in Paul's circumstances, what do you suppose that you might pray for? I think I would pray that God would vindicate me. 
I think I might pray for divine deliverance from my chains. You know, like what happened in Philippi when God sent a supernatural earthquake that, that set Paul free from all of his chains and the magistrates were so freaked out by him, they begged him to just leave in peace. I think I might pray that God would bring a little divine justice on those who falsely accused me, on those who wrongly imprisoned me or who mistreated me. When Paul was on the island of Cyprus, he called down blindness on Elamis, the sorcerer. Maybe a little temporary blindness would fix their wagon. I might pray for an overthrow of the Roman Empire for the kingdom to come. I might pray for better conditions. I might pray for grace, for patience. I might pray that the Lord would give my friends, the Philippians, more boldness. But Paul prayed for none of those things. What did Paul pray for? He prayed for more and more love. This is my prayer, that your love may increase more and more. Can you imagine? After all that he's been through, after all he's enduring, Paul prays for an increase of love. Father, let my friends experience more and more of your love for them and help them to love you and one another more and more. In this prayer, Paul reveals to us how love increases. Paul tells us that love increases through learning more and more about God by experiencing him in his word. This is my prayer, that your love might abound more and more in knowledge. That, that word that Paul uses here for knowledge is not an ordinary word. He uses the word epinosis, which means to, to know someone by personal experience. A couple of years ago, Denise and I were invited to London to go meet Nikki Gumbel, the author of the Alpha Course that we offer here at Harvest Time. Now, I've read a couple of Nikki's books. Uh, I've watched his Alpha Course videos so many times. Pastor Nick and I actually, back in the office, we repeat whole blocks of the Alpha Course in Nikki's accent. I've heard Nikki Gumbel speak live at conferences, but when we went to London, Denise and I were invited to their home to have breakfast with them. Now, after that, I can tell you much more about Nikki Gumbel than I could before. I've had a personal conversation with him. I've watched he and his wife banter playfully back and forth. I've heard her stories about him. I now know him by personal experience. And that's precisely what Paul means when he says, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge. My prayer is that your love for God might increase more and more by experiencing him. Yes. The starting point for personally experiencing God is faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 11, all this comes through Jesus. When we believe on Jesus, we personally experience God's presence with us. It's like we're sitting at the breakfast table with him. The Holy Spirit comes and lavishly pours God's love into our hearts. And then we grow in God's love as we learn more and more about him, experiencing him in his word. You know, Nicky Gumbel's books are great, but the Bible is a supernatural book. Yeah. And as we read the Bible, it's the only book that as we read it, the, the author is right there beside us. Yeah. As we read the Bible, God actually reaches out of it and his presence embraces us. Yeah. When we read the Bible, it's like sitting at the breakfast table with God. Right. While we're learning new things about him, we experience him. While we're learning about his infinite grace and his unfailing mercy and his faithfulness, we experience him. While we're learning about his perfect justice, while we're learning about his compassion, his patience, his persistence, we experience him. Yeah. I came across this quote this week that I absolutely love. Every new thing that we learn about him gives us a new reason to love him more. You see, to know him is to love him, and to know him more is to love him more. How does our love increase? 
through experiencing him and his word. And second, Paul says that our love increases from receiving the wisdom that comes by the Holy Spirit. This is my prayer, that your love might increase more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That, that word depth of insight, it's in Proverbs 22 times. It means wisdom for living. When we belong to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and he gives us this wisdom. Yes. Jesus talked about that. Jesus said, I I'm going away, but I'm going to send you the comforter. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll be your teacher. And he'll help you remember everything I said. Now that doesn't mean that we can quote all the words of Jesus verbatim. What it does mean is that in every situation, the Holy Spirit instinctively helps us to know what Jesus would do. And Jesus always did the perfectly loving thing, didn't he? Now that doesn't mean that Jesus was never tough. He was very direct at times. But Jesus was always loving in his desire for people to be saved and to experience God's very best. As we rely on the Holy Spirit, moment by moment, he leads us into doing the perfectly loving thing, just like Jesus did. And that's how our love increases more and more, experiencing God and his word as we learn about him and being led moment by moment by the Holy Spirit. This is my prayer, that your love may increase in knowledge and depth of insight. This is my prayer for petitions from Paul. Number one is for love's increase. Number two, my prayer is for love's discernment. My prayer is for love's discernment. This is my prayer, that your love might increase more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. Beloved, when we love God, when his love is growing inside of us, it creates an atmosphere of discernment in our hearts. I want you to listen this morning. Love for God is not a mere sentiment. Love for God shapes our decision making. Love for God affects the way we see everything. Love for God rearranges our priorities in life. In chapter 3, Paul says, The things that I once prize so dearly are now rubbish to me. Love for God refocuses our life. Paul says, this one thing I do, I press towards the excellent prize of knowing him. What is love's discernment? Well, first of all, love for God compels me to choose good over evil. In Romans 12, Paul wrote, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. You see, when we love God, what repulses him repulses us. Amen. When we love God, what delights him delights us. When we love God, we don't ever want to grieve his heart. We don't ever want to do things that would possibly create distance between us and him. Amen. Hebrews 5.14 says that through constant meditation an application of the word, those who are mature have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You know, a lot of believers today are unable to discern good and evil on even the most fundamental issues. And really, it calls into question the extent of our love for God. It calls into question whether or not we've been growing more and more by experiencing him in his word, having breakfast with him every day, as it were. If we're unable to discern what the Bible explicitly calls good and evil, how on earth will we be able to navigate the gray areas? That's good preaching right there. It's a little tough, but it's good preaching. What is love's discernment? Love for God compels me to choose good over evil, and love for God compels me to choose what is best yes. out of many competing options. Amen. Paul prays that our love will grow so that we can discern what is best. His words describe the work of an assayer of precious metals 
Determining the quality of those metals. Is it 10 karat gold? Is it 14 karat gold? Is it 18 karat gold? Is it pure 24 karat gold? Life offers us a lot of opportunities and experiences that are good, but love for God chooses what is best for me spiritually. Love for God chooses what's best for the continued growth of my relationship with Him. Love for God chooses what's best for the continued growth of my Christ-like character. Love for God chooses what Paul calls in chapter 3, forgetting everything else in exchange for the surpassing excellence of knowing Jesus. You know, a lot of times when we're considering what we should do as believers, we think in terms of right and wrong. Would it be wrong for me to do that as a believer? Would it be wrong for me to go there as a believer? But I want to tell you, love for God calls us to an even higher standard than that. Our question should not only be, is it harmful? Our question should be, is it helpful for my relationship with Jesus? Paul wrote to the Corinthians, everything is lawful for me. But not everything is best. Not everything is best for my intimacy with Christ. Not everything is best for my spiritual sharpness so that I'm ready to respond to the Holy Spirit. As you think about your own life, can you say that love has created this atmosphere of discernment in your heart? Do you discern between what's right and wrong as a believer? And more than that, do you discern what is best for your growth in his love? This is my prayer. Four petitions from Paul. Number one is for love's increase. Number two is for love's discernment. Number three, my prayer is for love's fruit. For love's fruit. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to determine, discern what is best and that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Beloved, love for God is not a mere sentiment. It has substance. Love for God isn't a mere feeling. It is a productive force in our life. It produces something tangible and measurable in my inner desires and attitudes, in my character and in my behavior. John said, this is how we know we love him if we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous for us. Jesus said, if we pursue a relationship with him, we'll bear spiritual fruit. Paul names three fruit here that I want to talk about. First of all, Paul says that love for God produces an unmixed heart. This is my prayer, that your love may increase more and more so that you may be pure. That that word pure is especially interesting. It means sun-tested. In Paul's day, pottery was used for all kinds of everyday chores, But sometimes in the manufacturing process, a pot would get cracked and a sneaky merchant would fill the crack with wax and then he would cover it up with glaze or with pottery dust. And you couldn't see that there was a crack there, but when you got home, you would discover that the pot didn't hold water and you had been deceived. But a pot displayed out in the sun was sun-tested. If it had any hidden cracks, the sun would melt the wax and expose the cracks. And so if it was displayed in the sun, you knew that it was a whole pot with no cracks. I got this from Pastor Nick, actually, after the first service. We get our word sincere from the potters in Rome. They would display their earthware, their pottery ware, with a sign that read sine sera, without wax. The fruit of love is that our hearts become sun-tested. Listen, there is nothing in my heart inconsistent with love for God that I'm covering up. There's no hidden deceit. 
There's no hypocrisy. Nothing sneaky. There's no hidden devotion to something else before him. I don't put money or power or pleasure or physical prowess ahead of him. My desires are pure. My motives are pure. My conduct is pure. What is love's fruit? An unmixed heart. And second, love for God produces consistent Christian character in me that doesn't cause others to stumble. This is my prayer, that your love may increase more and more so that you may be pure and blameless. That word blameless means I don't cause anyone else to trip. It means that my Christian character is consistent. My conduct is consistent so so that I don't blow it in front of those who are looking up to me. Beloved, can I tell you, I, I know that they give you a hard time at work when they find out that you're a Christian. Even here at Harvest Time, they give me a hard time at work when they know. <laughs> I, 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 know I know they give you a hard time. I know they taunt you a little bit. I know they push you a little bit. But can I tell you, they're watching. They're hoping that you don't mess up. They're hoping that you don't lose it. They're hoping that, that you don't blow it because they're looking for something real. Show me something real. Show me something authentic. Show me someone who has truly been transformed by a power greater than themselves. And that word blameless means that I conduct myself in such a way that I don't cause anyone to trip. You see, love for God is not only concerned about my relationship with Him. Love for God is concerned about others. It's concerned about pointing them to Him. What is love's fruit? An unmixed heart, not a stumbling block to others. And third, love for God produces an abundance of goodness from the inside out. This is my prayer that your love may increase more and more so that you may be pure, unmixed heart, blameless, don't cause anybody to trip, and filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus said that, Remember John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Jesus said, if you pursue a relationship with me, you'll bear fruit and more fruit and much fruit and fruit that remains. That fruit comes naturally as a result of our relationship with him. Fruitfulness is not my efforts at being good or keeping the rules. It's what Jesus causes to grow inside of me. It comes through him. In Galatians 5.22, Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then he goes on to list eight different dimensions of love. You might have learned it like I did, that there are nine fruit of the Spirit. That, that's not actually quite right. There's only one fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, manifest in many different ways. The fruit of the Spirit is love which produces a joyful heart inside of me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, which produces inner peace. The word is actually wholeness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, which produces long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is love, which produces gentleness. Love, which produces good behavior, goodness. Love, which produces faithfulness. Love, which produces meekness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, which produces self-control. That's the fruit of righteousness, to be like Jesus in every way. This is my prayer for petitions from Paul. I pray for love's increase. I pray for love's discernment. I pray for love's fruit. And finally, my prayer is for love's ultimate victory. For love's ultimate victory. Think about it with me for just a minute, would you? With all that Paul had been through, with all that that he was suffering at the moment, worship team, you can, can come help me finish up, with all that he was suffering, why choose to pray for more love? Not just once, but but Paul actually wrote four letters during this two-year house arrest in Rome. And every one of those letters written during this period opened with the same prayer for love that produces wisdom and fruit. Why pray for love? It's because Paul had an end game in mind. 
He, he had an ultimate goal in mind that was higher than freedom from prison. He had a, a goal in mind that was higher than vengeance or vindication. Why pray for more love? Well, it's because love is what will make us ready for the day of Christ. Paul was awaiting trial on capital charges in front of Nero, the most dreaded Roman emperor in all of Roman history. Nero crucified Christians. Nero lit them up like tiki torches in his garden at night and burned them. He, he fed them to the wild beasts in the arena for sport. We're talking at, at the dinner table last night. My son Ben pointed out waiting for trial in front of Nero would be like waiting for trial in front of Kim Jong-un. But Paul wasn't worried about Nero. There was another judgment day that Paul was focused on. Two times in these opening verses of Philippians, Paul mentions the day of Jesus Christ. Beloved, listen to me. There is a day coming when Jesus is coming back to planet Earth in his Father's glory with legions of holy angels. The first time Jesus came, he came as the Lamb of God who laid down his life to take away the sins of the world. But when Jesus comes again, he will come as the conquering Lion of Judah. Every eye will behold him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Jesus said, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words before this wicked and adulterous generation, I'll be ashamed of him when I come on that day. There's a day coming when we will all stand before God one by one. Each of us will give an account to him. With all that was going on, why pray for more love of all things? Well, it's because love is the only thing that can get us ready to stand in front of him on that day. In Philippians 3, Paul says, On that day, may I be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own making from trying to keep the rules, but possessing the righteousness that comes as a gift from God through faith in Jesus Christ. Why pray for love? Love is the only thing that will get us ready to stand before him, and love will bring glory and praise to the Father. This is my prayer that your love may increase more and more to the glory and praise of God. When we grow in love, when we grow in discernment, when we're pure, when we're blameless, when we're full of the fruit of righteousness, God gets all the glory. Do, do you realize that? The more beautiful you grow in Christ, the more God gets the glory. People look at you and they say, you didn't do that. You were a mess. I knew you before. Look what God has done. Look at the beautiful thing God has made. Jesus said, if you remain in me, if you continue in relationship with me, you will bear fruit. Listen to this, John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. You know, when a tree bears fruit, it's a sign that the tree is alive. But when a tree bears much fruit, it's a sign that the gardener knows what he's doing. And when you bear much fruit, you show that the gardener, the Father knows what he's doing. Let me finish with this final thought and we're done. We're going to receive communion together. In Philippians 1, love is the good work that God started in you that he'll be faithful to bring to completion. 
Philippians 1, 6 is one of the best loved promises in the whole Bible. I cling to this promise. I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Listen to what it says. Against the day of Jesus Christ is what it says. Beloved, listen to me. God has promised he'll take care of you. He's promised he'll prosper all the work of your hands. He's promised that he'll bless you, provide for you, that he'll heal you, that he'll preserve you, that he'll show his favor to your children and to your grandchildren. God has promised all those things, but that is not the essence of his good work in you. The essence of his good work in you is love. Love's increase, love's discernment, love's fruit and love's ultimate victory harvest time this is my prayer for you would you stand on your feet and give Jesus the King of Kings and Lord of Lords a great big praise in this place today